Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. Medical marijuana is now available in 28 states, but a big obstacle to research on marijuana as medicine is that it's listed by the federal government on what's called Schedule 1. Assignment to Schedule 1 means that the Food and Drug Administration does not recognize a legitimate medical purpose to a substance. At a session on medical marijuana at the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science on February 19th, I asked researcher Ryan Vandry of the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine about getting marijuana off of the list of Schedule I substances. Uh, well, it can't come off of Schedule One to a different schedule until the, the traditional drug development work has been done. And I don't think the traditional drug development work really can be done uh, while it's Schedule One. It just makes large Phase Three trials in hospital-based programs near impossible. It's a catch-22. Catch so I think the only way to really get around that is kind of two paths. One, you just unschedule it completely. Uh, alcohol is not scheduled, for example, and so that's the pathway that some of the states have gone, just making it available, uh, or treating as a as a like a botanical herbal product. Uh, the other way uh, would be to kind of wait until we get more targeted specific products, so not whole plant cannabis, but maybe more specific formulations um, with specific cannabinoid profiles would be the other way. Is your life be easier with it all? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Without a doubt. <laughs> and, and just to clarify, the, the limitations that we have in doing research is that we are limited to uh, doing research with products that are available through the Federal Drug Supply Program. Uh, and, and so they have quite a bit, but they don't have everything. Uh, and then the limitation is even using their product we have to go through extra levels of regulatory scrutiny and, and su experience substantial delays uh, in doing our research. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. Fifty thousand years ago, Homo sapiens weren't the only game in town. We were just one of several species of hominids roaming the earth, like the Neanderthals in Eurasia. And when our sapiens ancestors came in contact with them, they sometimes hooked up, which means many people today of Eurasian descent still carry copies of Neanderthal genes. But what do those genes do? Researchers tried to answer that question by examining the modern human genome. And they found that, on average, Neanderthal versions of genes are not active as much as their modern human counterparts, in the brain or the testicles, meaning Neanderthal variants have less influence there. Possibly, the researchers say, because those tissues underwent significant changes since what became modern humans and Neanderthals diverged 700,000 years ago. Really, our results show that Neanderthal sequences that are present in modern humans aren't just kind of silent remnants of hybridization that occurred 50,000 years ago, but uh, they really have widespread measurable impacts on gene expression to this day. Rajiv McCoy, an evolutionary geneticist at the University of Washington. In other words, genes we got from Neanderthals, they play roles in the activation of various other of our genes, leading to the production of different kinds of proteins. The studies in the journal Cell. It also turns out that for one gene in particular, if you carry the Neanderthal mutation, you have slightly lower risk of schizophrenia, and you also have slightly increased height on average. The Neanderthals left their mark on lots of modern human traits, in addition to schizophrenia and height. But McCoy says, keep in mind. These are complex traits, and they're controlled by thousands of different genes, and we're measuring statistically significant effects. Neanderthals are long gone, but some of their genes live on. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Over millions of years, penguins have evolved a keen sense of where to find food. Once they're old enough, they set off from the shores on which they hatched for the first time and swim long distances in search of tasty fish like anchovies and sardines. But they don't search directly for the fish themselves. For example, when young endangered African penguins head out to sea, they look for areas with low surface temperatures and high chlorophyll, because those conditions signal the presence of phytoplankton. 
And lots of phytoplankton means lots of zooplankton, which in turn means lots of their favorite fish. Well, that's what it used to mean. Climate change plus overfishing have made the penguin feeding grounds a mirage. The habitat is indeed plankton-rich, but now it's fish-poor. Researchers call this kind of scenario an ecological trap. It's a situation where you have a signal that previously pointed an animal towards good quality habitat. That habitat's been changed usually by rapidly induced human pressure, so um, usually anthropogenic change. And the signal stays, but the underlying quality and environment deteriorates. University of Exeter zoologist Richard Shirley. He and his team used satellite imaging to track the dispersal of 54 recently fledged African penguins from eight sites along southern Africa. Historically, the birds benefited from tons of fish along the coasts of Angola, Namibia, and western South Africa, but now they're going hungry. I was really hoping we'd see them going east and finding the areas where the fish had shifted to, so I was quite surprised to be wrong, and unfortunately quite sad to be wrong in this case, because it ends up being quite a a sad story for the penguins. The researchers calculate that by falling into this ecological trap, African penguin populations on South Africa's Western Cape have declined by around 80%. The findings are in the journal Current Biology. Some research groups are exploring the idea of translocating chicks to a place where they can't get trapped, like the Eastern Cape, but Shirley thinks that a longer-term solution means implementing regulations to create more sustainable fisheries, something that he says has public support. And as for the penguins? They're not necessarily yet in an extinction vortex. Yeah, it's not hopeless yet. (laughs) But time flies, unlike penguins. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Jason Goldman. In their heyday, woolly mammoths blanketed the Siberian steppe, Alaska, and large parts of North America. But by 10,000 years ago, warming climates had turned many of the grasslands they grazed into forest. And humans, well, they weren't so friendly either. One mammoth provides quite a feast. So the mammoths largely disappeared, except there's this one holdout population on an island in the Arctic Ocean called Wrangell Island, where the last mammoths hid out for more than 6,000 years. So the pyramids had been built and they had started to grow tea in China and civilization had formed. And and then here are these mammoths that no one knew were there for such a long period of time. Rebecca Rogers, an evolutionary geneticist at the University of North Carolina. And then people finally found this island around 3,700 years ago, around the time that they went extinct. Rogers and her colleague, Montgomery Slatkin, analyzed the genome from the tooth of one of those island mammoths, which lived 4,300 years ago. They compared it to the genome of a mainland mammoth from much farther back, 45,000 years. And they found that harmful mutations had polluted the island mammoth's genome in that time interval. Mutations that led to the loss of smell receptors and urine proteins, compounds they probably needed for social signaling and mate choice. And the animals also developed this satiny coat that shines in the light. It's a trait that's actually popular for pet breeders today, for rabbits and guinea pigs. And the reason for all these mutations... Rogers says there just weren't enough individuals on the island, a thousand at the most, 300 at their lowest, to allow natural selection to run its course. So it wasn't survival of the fittest, it was survival of whoever randomly survived, which meant they accumulated a lot of mutations, none of which made them drop dead, but they weren't all that fit either. The studies in the journal PLOS Genetics. Rogers says a similar process could happen for rare animals on Earth today, like cheetahs and pandas and gorillas. If you have a very small population for a very long time, you can get this accumulation of bad mutations in their genomes. And so we would expect to see the same effects for them. It does take a long time period to get a signal as big as what we saw in the mammoths. So the earlier we can intervene for those species, the better off they will be. As for those humans who long ago found this last holdout of mammoths on Wrangell Island? We don't have direct evidence that they hunted the mammoths on the island, but, you know, you kind of wish that they had taken them back and domesticated them. And there's already one interested buyer. Oh, yes. If you can find one, I would like to have one as a pet. Preferably a little smaller so it fits in my house. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Back in January, one of California's oldest and most iconic residents keeled over. The Pioneer Cabin Tree, a giant sequoia in Calaveras Big Trees State Park. It was so big you used to be able to drive through it. 
the giant was blown over by high winds, delivered by what's called an atmospheric river, a long stream of water vapor in the atmosphere, 100 miles wide. And these systems might be thought of as some of the biggest rivers on Earth. You could kind of pose it that way, yeah. Dwayne Walliser, an atmospheric scientist at the Jet Propulsion Lab. An atmospheric river will carry the same amount of water vapor as, say, 15 to 20 Mississippi rivers. Walliser and his JPL colleague, Bin Guan, developed an algorithm to detect atmospheric rivers in historical data so they could connect the sky flow to extreme events on land. And they found that if you look at just the top 2% of the most extreme wind and rain and snowstorms in the world's mid-latitude regions, atmospheric rivers are linked up to half of them. And of the 19 windstorms in Europe that cost insurance companies the most money, billions of dollars in damage, atmospheric rivers were behind three-quarters of those events. The study is in the journal Nature Geoscience. Looking ahead as global temperatures rise, that warmer air is going to hold more water vapor. If the climate does warm, you would tend to have stronger or more frequent atmospheric rivers. And as this study shows, it won't just be that a hard rain's going to fall. We'll be blown in the wind, too. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliato.